So it's sometimes a little bit of a calming force when the emotion after a loss like that Man. is still raging the next day and, and his voice can come in and be like, oh, dude, here's, here's what's going on and here, here's what we're seeing, here's what's happening in the locker room. So I don't know if that'll happen again. Let's find out. It is uh, Odyssey NFL insider Peter King. Is, is that something you can uh, you can do for 49er fans today? Is there a reason for calm or maybe otherwise? What do you think, Peter? I wouldn't. I wouldn't be that concerned, quite honestly. And there's two reasons why. Um, in the course of every season, you're going to have a, a shaky run. And they're in the middle of it now. We talked about this last week that if uh, a kicker who could have made a 40-yard field goal four out of five in high school had made his field goal last week, nobody would have said anything. And... Now, all of a sudden, that it's two in a row, the sky is falling. And I would, I guess I would just say something about yesterday's game. I was a little concerned about the defense and the fact that, you know, without Justin Jefferson, Kirk Cousins basically ran amok. Um, and I do think that's concerning. I think the call at the end of the first half, which obviously I'm sure has been well discussed out there, was well discussed all over social media after the game about running a zero blitz in that situation um, and handing him a touchdown right before halftime. That's kind of a bummer. But I also think that if you're going to play a game without two of your best ten players, maybe two of your best five or six players, Trent Williams at left tackle and, uh, and Debo Samuel at wide receiver, uh, if you're going to play the game where you really kind of need to score some points and you know you're going to need to score some points to win and those guys are gone and your quarterback is kind of running for his life more than usual, uh, it's going to be hard to win a game. And so that's why, in my opinion, there are some times when you should be really, really concerned and there are some times when you should say, this loss is understandable, and I think that loss was understandable, although I do think that Brock Purdy, probably for the three-and-a-half-hour flight back home last night, had to be absolutely kicking himself. He had plenty of time at the end of the game to just do what he always does, which is to hit the open guy. And what he tried to do on that last throw, from my eyes, is he tried to force it into a guy in a very small window where there was too many guys with the other jerseys on in coverage. So I think he probably learned something from that. I think there's a good chance that Kyle Shanahan learned something from that. But I, I, I would be concerned about the loss, but I wouldn't be overly concerned. I still think they're one of the best five or six teams in football. And that's sort of a growing pains thing for Brock Purdy, and we can look at that and perhaps excuse it. But, Peter, I look at 452 yards of total offense by Minnesota and a pass rush that generated zero sacks, and that's where I look at my concern that for the most part. Them. Yeah. What do you see from this defense, Peter, that's fallen short of the bar that they've been set? Um, well, I mean, last night I didn't see nearly enough pressure uh, on the quarterback, and look, uh, you know, there's a reason why Kyle Shanahan and John Lynch wanted to get Javon Hargrave into that defensive front, and the reason is they wanted to make sure that uh, they were going to be able to attack opposing quarterbacks, opposing passing games in waves, and it just wasn't there last night, and, you know, you'd have to look almost at individual plays, play by play, to figure out why it wasn't there. But, you know, to me the damning thing is you're playing a team without uh, the best wide receiver in football, and even though I think it's it's an overstatement to say they went up and down the field on them, they did were able to do far too much on offense than you should be able to do on a 49er defense. Peter King with us as he is every single Tuesday, Willard and Dibbs, 95-7 the game. Peter, you mentioned it in your opening answer, but I want to dive deeper with you on this. The call by Steve Wilkes to Blitz right before the end of the half. What could he have been thinking in, in that play? 
I think he could have been thinking and maybe he was thinking turnover. Um, but to me, it's just it's way too risky. It's just way, way too risky. And I'm sure that he looks at it now, you know, and saying, I'm positive that Steve Wilkes is saying that that call was a huge mistake. I got greedy. I got greedy. Because maybe he's thinking we turn him over here and we could, we could at least get a field goal before halftime. But the chances of doing a strip sack, recovering the ball, they're just, it's not worth it. It's just not worth it. You don't make that. You basically lick your wounds, go into halftime, and come out and, you know, live to fight another day. And obviously, if that play doesn't happen, there's a good chance the Niners win this game. So that's going to be something that, and, you know, you, you sort of saw at the end of the game, I read the transcript this morning, where Kyle Shanahan basically said, you know, I'm curious about it too. And so you can bet that Kyle Shanahan, uh, not long after that game or on the plane, had a conversation with Steve Wilkes about what he was thinking. And, and look, I'm just guessing. I don't know. I've not talked to either person, but I'm just guessing. I would bet that Kyle Shanahan passed along the message that let's not ever see that again. Right, certainly in that in that, in that <laughs> circumstance where 16 seconds left from their own 40. Even at that, though, Peter, they still had plenty of chances down the stretch to yep. win the game. Yep. The one thing that troubled me about the offense is something that maybe you can associate to Trent Williams being out, but the running game doesn't seem to be as dynamic. Are other teams right. figuring out the Shanahan system in the ground game? I think other teams... Are what I saw the Vikings do last night is I saw them basically playing the run with a lot of guys, and when you when you focus on stopping the run, I think you know, like if if you're Brian Flores last night, and look, the the one thing you have to say about the Minnesota Vikings, you know, we all kind of gave them up for dead when they were whatever zero and three. And the one thing you'd say about them in the last four weeks, they have really played well defensively. They have not uh, allowed anybody to go up and down the field on them. Uh, they've held teams, I think, to an average of 17 a game in the last four games, which I didn't think there was any chance the Vikings would do. I didn't think they were that talented on defense. Last night, in my opinion, uh, I think that they said we're not going to let Christian McCaffrey beat us. It was a classic, you know, Flores is off the Bill Belichick tree. Bill Belichick was very, very good at taking your best player away from the game. And obviously, McCaffrey did make some plays, but he was not dominant from, from minute one to minute 60 of this game. And my guess, looking at how that game was played, is because it, Christian McCaffrey did not dominate in the running game, obviously. But I think what you see with Christian McCaffrey is that if you load up the box on him, and that's what it looked like Minnesota was doing, and if when you throw it, you're having a hard time protecting Brock Purdy. And last night, I mean, Daniil Hunter had his best game of the year. And I think in part that's because you don't have that solid wall in front of Purdy. And so... I think it was sort of a perfect storm for the 49ers missing the guys they did and the guys who can make big offensive plays uh, and also protect Brock Purdy. You know, they were really missing a lot last night. Peter, the uh, trade deadline is exactly one week away. Uh, who are some of the names who you think uh, might be on the move and in what way might the 49ers be involved? I think it's going to be really interesting to watch uh, whether somebody will really step out and get aggressive and try to go get a very good edge rusher in Brian Burns of the Panthers. There's increasing speculation around Carolina that they're not going to be able to re-sign him. Um, And so uh, if somebody – he was a guy who Chicago was very interested in at the time that they made the huge trade for the first pick in the draft last year. They took DJ Moore. They were very interested also uh, in Brian Burns. So that's one name that I think is going to get 
some traction. Um, I think two other names are both Tennessee Titans. One is DeAndre Hopkins. I do think that if somebody makes even a decent offer, even with a day two pick, uh, I think Tennessee would be motivated to try to do something with Hopkins at the deadline. And the other one is, would somebody really step up and make a huge offer for Derrick Henry? I'm not saying a 2, 3, 4, and 5, a Christian McCaffrey type offer because he's got a little more uh, mileage on his vehicle, so to speak, in Derrick Henry. But I do think that he, you might be able to wrestle him away. He's a guy who Tennessee loves, but Tennessee's not going anywhere. I think the only other, only other name or only other sort of position group that you might hear some things about uh, is the Arizona Cardinals because, look, this is a team that you know we thought early on after they beat Dallas might be going, it might be not contending this year, but might be really a much better team than we thought. But it turns out they aren't. And uh, I think Zach Ertz would have been one of the guys who teams might have been interested in, but now they put him on IR, so that's more and more unlikely. But, you know, if somebody wants a speed receiver in Hollywood Brown, I would bet that you could probably get him uh, you know, from, from Arizona. So those are a few of the names I might expect to, to hear about in the next six days. Those are all great names. And I'm glad you put those out there, Peter. And I, I just was listening to him one by one and thinking, well, he doesn't fit here and he doesn't fit here, but what would the Niners maybe be looking for in terms of some sort of an upgrade considering they have a pretty stacked roster as it is? Yeah. I mean, if I were the 49ers and I thought that I could upgrade at corner, uh, if I could get somebody who, because look, the one thing that people don't talk about at this time of year, even there, there might be a trade made where people say, geez, why would, and I'm not, I'm not even suggesting this, but, but if let's say uh, 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 San Francisco would be, is sniffing around about Derrick Henry. The only reason that you would, and you would say, well, that's, that's not smart. They don't have enough carries to give to Henry and everything. But you also have to think that in the last nine weeks of the season, which is what you're going to be playing for after the trade deadline, the la- maybe it's 10, but at least the last nine weeks of the season, there are going to be injuries. And especially we've talked about it, a physical team like the Niners, uh, you know, a team like Dallas, I would not be surprised if Dallas started looking for a running back, especially a big physical running back uh, like Derrick Henry. But if I were the Niners, I'd probably look more secondary than anywhere else. Yeah, that makes a whole lot of sense. Peter King with us, as always, on Tuesdays here on Willard and Dibs, 95-7 the game. Peter, let's let's get to Brock Purdy. Uh, we know the questions are there every week, and it, 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 people have been working their way through small sample size, draftism, yeah. as we've talked about. What about this? Did something become a little bit more clear last night? My question about Purdy is what kind of success can he have when the defense knows he's going to throw? And and maybe that's the question for, for Kyle Shanahan, too, with the 0-36 record when trailing by eight entering the fourth quarter. What do you think? Is that a more focused and fair question about what Brock Purdy can and can't do? Well, the first thing I would say is I think the game was affected a lot by the protection, which was not vintage, and by the, you know, the loss of, of Trent Williams. Uh, the game obviously was affected by not having the impact uh, you know, of, uh, uh, of Debo Samuel. But having said that, I don't like the throw that Brock Purdy made at the end of the game. Um, I think, and I I didn't look it up at the time, but I said, man, my first impression was they had plenty of time. Why are you forcing the ball downfield like that? And I'm not saying go total dink and dunk. Maybe you take a chance downfield, but you have to take a chance where only your guy can get it. 
And you know what's interesting? Brock Purdy has not been making those type of those types of throws. So that's why I tend to think, well, that's an outlier. I'm not going to sit here and say awful throw that proves that Purdy is suspect. I don't do that. I think that Purdy probably thought that he could fit a ball in a place that he really couldn't. I thought he made some very good throws last night. Uh, some good downfield and very good sideline throws last night. But at the end of the day, and I'm not sure you can look at that game and say, ah, we found out something about Purdy. Any quarterback who gets pressure like that, I mean, like, I don't know how anybody judges Daniel Jones right now. It's, it's, it's impossible. If you don't like him, that's one thing. If you, if you come into this season thinking he can't do it, well, that's been reinforced this year, but it's only been reinforced because in the first five games of the season, He got hit 82 times and sacked 28. And so how is anybody going to be able to survive and play well when, you know, you don't have a chance? And so I'm not saying Brock Purdy didn't have a chance. He had a chance at the end. And, you know, I think the one thing that I'm sure Kyle Shanahan will tell him when they're looking back at this game, the one thing is going to be, hey, listen, you know, when you got 40 seconds, you don't need to take it all in one bite. You know, we have e- e- timeouts or no timeouts. We have plenty of ways to stop the clock, throw the ball in the middle of the field and go clock it. But that was a mistake that I think I'd call it highly uncharacteristic for Brock Purdy in his first year plus in the NFL. And I would expect that we don't see that again. Yeah, Niner fans would hope you don't see it as soon as this Sunday. And I wonder, Peter, if Brock isn't somehow and somewhat of a victim of the Kyle Shanahan system because they don't do a lot of three wide and four wide receiver sets. Yeah. So when you get into that catch-up mode, are they more hamstrung than other teams just based on system? No, because I think that Brock Purdy, for much of his career as a, play, as a college and pro football quarterback, uh, has been in the mode of, uh, y- you know, I don't have, uh, I don't have every advantage. Like I don't have the arm strength that some guys have. I have to rely on especially intermediate accuracy. So, and I always think, look, the thing people will say about the Shanahan offense is that, look, any good offensive designer and offensive play caller should say what I'm about to say. But the reputation in with people who've played for Kyle Shanahan is that on every play that is called, you are going to have the ability to find somebody at some point in that play who's open. And I don't know if you guys, I was listening for the first half to Peyton Manning, Peyton and Eli talking about uh, the game. And at one point, and I wrote it down, I don't, I don't have it right with me, but I wrote it down and, and Manning said, he throws that dagger route, you know, that, that, ba- that route where you go upfield and you basically turn around almost and cut in a little bit. Okay. He, he said he throws that route as good as anybody. And, and you and and he and he talked about how he was through that route before, uh, and I forget who it was, but he threw that route. It might have been Kittle. I forget. Threw that route before the receiver turned around. And his point was that is the only way that you can have long term success in the NFL. It's how Brady succeeded for years. I bet a quarter of the throws he made in his life to receivers and tight ends were made before the guy turned around looking for the ball. And so the timing is absolutely uh, crucial. And so I still, I still would have enough faith in Brock Purdy, and he's going to have plenty of chances to make throws and to win games. I, I just think last night, and again, look, I'm not absolving him because, as we said, that last throw was a bad decision by him. However, however, you know, you're not used to the 49ers getting handled on the defensive side of the ball. And Kirk Cousins made a lot of plays 
on that defense. And I think that defense simply has to get more pressure in a game where you're trying to compensate for the losses of Trent Williams and Debo Samuel. Okay, Peter, that's the point. And, and, and so before you go, can we dive deeper on that? The, the 49ers have the highest paid player in the history of defense uh, sitting there rushing the passer. There's Armstead, there's Hargrave, there's more. Only the yeah. New York Giants, the Rams, the Jags, Texans, and Bears have a worse sack rate than that group this year. So we can say yeah, they need to get better, surprise. but my question yeah. is why aren't they? What, what, what is going on there? I, I have one pet theory, and that is that I think that teams more, maybe more than they have in the past, but I noticed it last night. There was a great clip where TJ Hawkinson went up the seam and he caught like an 18 yard uh, dart from Kirk Cousins. But Peyton and Eli were so impressed with Hawkinson before the play. And you've got to give Kevin O'Connell credit for this. Okay. Because I noticed this a lot last night. There were very few times, very few where uh, Nick Bosa came in blocked by one person without having somebody else pay attention to him. And the reason I brought up the Hawkinson play is that he chipped him very nicely on that play. He didn't, he didn't jolt him. He just threw him a little bit off course so that he couldn't get that momentum to run around edge. And I think that's what teams are doing more and more. They're keeping one guy in sometimes to chip and one guy and sometimes to, to simply, you know, sell out to make sure that whether it's, uh, whether it's Hargrave, whether it's Bosa, does not get to the quarterback. And that's what, to me, Steve Wilkes, this Steve, and, and look, you know, this is not a great offensive line they're facing in Cincinnati. And this is not Lamar Jackson they're facing at quarterback. This is a guy who can be hit. And this is going to be a game where it's very, very important that they hit and bother Joe Burrow. Because if they don't, you know, even though he's not perfect physically, if they don't, Joe Burrow could light them up. And I think this is a really this is this is probably a bigger game for that defensive front than it is for Brock Purdy, at least in my eyes. I think this defensive front has to have more of an impact on the game against Cincinnati than they have had the last couple of weeks. Uh, agree with you completely, yeah. Peter. Uh, fantastic stuff. We always appreciate your time, and we already look forward to next week. Okay, guys, thanks a lot. There it is. Peter and that King. was Odyssey NFL insider Peter King.